Hi, my name is Kundo, and I'm a part of the uh, Dropbox infrastructure team. Today, today I'm going to discuss the evolution of the serving infrastructure for Dropbox um, from the beginning to the present day, and sort of the evolving use of AWS over time at Dropbox. So a quick history lesson. Um, in the beginning, well, in the beginning of Dropbox anyway, there was the server. Dropbox started, like most uh, services, fairly modestly because you know, we we're just getting off the ground. In early 2008, we uh, had already had 50,000 users. We were in early beta, still getting the kinks out. And at that point, we already had two kind of chunks of machines. Before I go into the details of those, it's first like, uh, useful to think about what files are. Files consist of metadata and file data. So the metadata was stored in a MySQL instance, which uh, was behind a metadata server. And both of those were hosted in managed hosting because early 2008 EC2 was a little challenging for a MySQL database. In AWS, we hosted the file data. So every file uploaded to Dropbox by a user is split up into chunks, encrypted, and stored in S3. The file data server sits between S3 and our users to provide vital um, functions such as authentication. The file data server it was sort of an ideal case for EC2 because, well, for one thing, the file data, it made sense to store all that amount of data and what we hoped would be an ever-expanding set of data in S3. And the bandwidth between S3 and EC2 is free. So we only paid once for the bandwidth going out from the file data servers to our users. Also, the file data servers are stateless. So we were able to spin up and down EC2 instances according to user traffic, which, in the early, especially in the early days of Dropbox, when we were a um, cash-strapped startup, was a pretty big deal in terms of managing costs. Like anything else, though, AWS had its, is had its issues. We had unexplained problems. We had kernel crashes. We had variability in I.O. and network performance. At one point in time, 1% of the um, instances that we had in EC2 failed in a given day, which took a lot, big toll on our team. And hot failovers, while a very good idea in general, were really expensive in AWS. And again, we didn't have a whole lot of cash on hand at that point. AWS outages were also you know, occasion issue. While AWS has a great track record overall for reliability, like everything else, it has outages. And when the outages do occur, they can last for multiple hours sometimes. And during those hours, you can do nothing but wait, look at the AWS dashboard, and hit refresh once in a while. Managed hosting was not perfect either, not by any stretch of the imagination. We had little control over a lot of the components that uh, went into servicing our request and that went into uh, the end user experience. For example, at one point in time, a bunch of clients of ours, a bunch of Dropbox clients, had to reconnect to one of our backend services. This series of massive like, reconnections triggered DDoS protection in one of the routers that was sitting in the managed hosting provider's network. And again, well, during that time, we could only you know, file tickets, call, and just kind of wait and wait for this, um, the, the um, router to sort of you know, stop its uh, DDoS protection. In a number of cases, we wanted more configurability on our boxes. For example, MySQL likes memory. Like the NODB buffer pool like, um, generally performs really well when you add more and more memory to it. Unfortunately, with a hosting provider, you only get so much memory maximum in any of your boxes. And finally, our team was wasting a lot of time, just like roughly three nights a week, debugging problems that, frankly, they just really couldn't get to the bottom of because they didn't have access to all the pieces of equipment and all the software in between our users and Dropbox. So for all these reasons and a lot more, we looked into having data center space. However, that raised a bunch of questions. We had all sorts of things like, you know, when would we order our machines? Like, how much lead time do we need? Who handles the physical hardware as it arrives? There was a bunch of things that we didn't have as much experience with and we needed to figure out. 
Regardless, we knew it was the right decision, so we came up with a migration plan for moving the metadata, all this, the, the databases and the servers that were in managed hosting, into our own data centers. We first automated machine installs, the OS, the, um, all the system packages that need to uh, be there, and, of course, our own software. We needed to create a stable hardware platform, so to reduce the number of variables, we started by kind of cloning the hardware configuration that we had from a managed hosting provider for the metadata stuff. And that, that turned out to be pretty useful because, you know, we, could, we knew that we could trust those drivers. We knew that we could trust or the interactions of those drivers with MySQL, with our web server, and all the other stuff that we run in our stack. And just in general, it, it was nice to have fewer variables. Regardless of the testing that we did and the planning that we did, we still ran into unexpected performance issues. We did a lot of testing with database write performance because Dropbox is very write query heavy. And it was also a little bit more challenging to test reads for various reasons. Unfortunately, when we, uh, you know, when we took the, my, the steps to migrate, read performance actually became an issue. We resolved that, but it was one of the unexpected things that came along the way. Also, in the early days of our presence in the data center, we, we had an HVAC unit spraying mysterious fluids into our boxes. And so I'm, I'm not particularly like a master of chemistry or anything, but um, I'm pretty sure that any kind of fluid spraying into your boxes is kind of a bad idea. And we also had to hire a bunch of like tech ops roles that we either only had like, you know, one person doing or a fraction of a person doing or no one doing because there's a lot of work that gets put, that, that's put into um, bringing a data center online and keeping it online. Capacity planning also became a bigger concern. Like previously, we effectively outsourced that to Amazon and our hosting provider. Now we had to figure out, oh, okay, you know, which vendors do we, um, do we order from? How long do they take? How many do we order? If we undershoot, you know, we put a ceiling on our own organic growth. If we, if we um, order too many machines, then we pull in our costs a little too early and we eat away our cash. There's all sorts of you know, things that went into the equation. And plus, different features take off at different rates and have different uh, hardware requirements. And it bec it's, it's challenging to kind of like fit all that together into a coherent you know, puzzle. But in the end, we brought our first data center online and we realized some immediate benefits. The networking cost, specifically for the metadata server, which as you might recall, was in our managed hosting provider, like the networking cost went down 50% right up front. In addition, we realized increased reliability. We, for the issues that we did have, we had more inside control so we could fix issues more quickly. And our database machines were a lot faster because we could tweak the RAID controller, we could add more spindles for the disk, and then later on SSDs and, and put more memory in there and all this stuff. And just in general, we had a way of like kind of pulling individual lovers like CPU and RAM and all this other stuff to match sort of the, our increasingly specialized needs over time. So here's a simplified version of today's architecture. I won't go into all the details, but let me highlight a few things. In our data center right now, we have a number of things, a number of services that service the uh, metadata as well as the uh, Dropbox website. The, sort of the main kind of components here are, you know, the web servers, HA proxy um, for um, load balancing, and HBase, Zookeeper, Memcache, uh, and a bunch of MySQL um, databases that are sharded. In AWS, we still have all of our file data in S3. We have the file data servers acting as a front end, and a couple other things that I'll mention real soon. And we have over 200 million users um, using this infrastructure. So let's zoom out a little bit. Again, we have the data center, and we have AWS. We also have a couple other data centers that came online, um, and we're building out, like we're building into those. And it's a safe bet that we're going to build more data centers in the future. 
So going back to AWS, even though we have built out a substantial hardware footprint, we still use AWS for a lot of critical things. For example, we use S3 for file data, EC2, Elastic Load Balancer, Route 53 for external DNS and health checking, and SQS for queuing up work items that need to be done asynchronously. Additionally, we use EC2 for a number of offline jobs. These are things that can't be done in real time for various reasons, performance usually. Uh, for example, every photo in Dropbox has some thumbnails. When we started pre-generating those thumbnails for, um, for Dropbox photos, we had to process all existing photos. So we spun up a couple thousand EC2 instances. We let them crunch the data for a couple of weeks. Uh, and extract thumbnails from the photos. And at the end of those couple of weeks, we spun them down, and we incurred no further costs. This was sort of an ideal scenario for EC2. AWS still has its challenges to this day, though. Like, it's, it would be particularly challenging, I think, to replace all of our physical machines with EC2 instances, because each physical machine can do quite a bit more QPS for whatever service than the, equivalent, than the closest equivalent EC2 instance. And so we'd have, we'd have to use a lot more EC2 instances. And when you, use, when you do that, when you introduce more instances, you have a lot more potential for issues in general. In the case of databases, because each instance is less powerful, we need to shard the database more ways, and we'd have more failure points, possibly. And it would just be more of like a lot of different kind of maintenance costs. You also can't really escape the hypervisor uh, between the software and the hardware. And it's tough to reason through all the different performance characteristics and reliability characteristics of the hypervisor because you just don't have any insight into it. And while AWS does a lot of things particularly well, it scales really nicely for a lot of um, scenarios, there are a lot of things that you learn from doing certain things yourself. You learn, you, know, you learn how to deal with fires, you learn how to make scalable software, and a lot of these lessons and a lot of the sort of the custom software that you, you end up having to write um, as you grow and scale are much easier to do uh, when you're smaller, when there are fewer eyes on you, when everything has way less impact, and when your mistakes get amplified a lot less. When you're operating at scale, it's, you know, it, it's, it's a def definitely a different ball game. So in the end, we end up using the right tool for the job. The hybrid model is right for our Dropbox's particular set of needs. We use AWS for storing all the file data. We use a bunch of the very solid and scalable Amazon Web Services. We use the elasticity of EC2. For our dedicated hardware, we make use of the raw individual machine performance, the control over all the different pieces of, of, of the hardware configuration, and the visibility we have into every component that sits, every component at least within our network boundaries. And the lower cost, especially when you, when you, when you count things like specialized hardware, when you want like a machine with 128 gigabytes of memory, a couple of dozen cores, that, that kind of power, it's, it's, it's much... Um, cheaper to go um, with your own hardware. So, thank you for listening to the talk. And we have a, we, Dropbox definitely has a, a nice big booth. So please visit us, chat with us about tech ops stuff or life in general. Thank you. <laughs>